we we'll make a start, it's just uh, gone five past five, well, in the UK at least. Um, and I appreciate some of our Australian colleagues, it's it's really, we're getting in the middle of the night. Um, so um, let's kick off with this, our first um, uh, um, for the 2020 um, UK uh, Implementation Science Research Conference. Uh, for those of you who have attended previous events, remember that our commitment has always been from the first conference that the first plenary of this event should always be given by someone who's using um, uh, services, who's really interfacing and interacting uh, with services and is not necessarily, um, uh, you know, by profession in an implementation science or implementation researcher. And, and true to this, I'm, I'm really delighted to uh, introduce to all of you um, a colleague and uh, friend, Dave Taylor, um, who will open um, uh, well, the, the, the series of plenaries for this uh, conference with his um, his plenary on uses and abuses of, 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 of IT and will uh, revisit a lot of um, sort of implementation um, pitfalls and failures, but also successes um, in implementing IT solutions. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing Dave for a number of years and working with him for a while. Um, Dave is currently the Vice Chair of the Patients Association, which is a national charity um, in the United Kingdom, but also the patient lead for the Royal Society of Medicine in uh, the Digital Health Council of the Royal Society of, of, of Medicine. Um, Dave has spent um, a, a many years as, as an expert, so a senior professional in the space of developing and implementing um, IT and digital uh, interventions. Many of those years um, uh, we've had, um, I've had the luck of um, um, coinciding with him at Imperial College in the Department of Surgery. And um, so that's where we've, we've um, uh, met. So um, I think uh, having spoken to Dave um, about his uh, plenary, I think it's, it's eminently uh, relevant to the, the sort of um, uh, the, the current crisis and sort of post-crisis recovery that we're all going through uh, because of COVID, but also wider, the wider environment of trying to implement successfully IT and digital um, interventions in healthcare. So without further ado, um, I'd like to, um, uh, I would normally say I'd like to invite Dave to uh, uh, start, but I think what um, the format will require is us to launch um, the pre-recorded um, uh, plenary that uh, Dave has prepared uh, and then we will take um, uh, questions, comments and reflections from the audience uh, in, in real time live um, uh, uh, after the plenary is concluded which will take about 30 minutes. So uh, I would suggest that uh, we launch uh, the plenary and please do use the Q&A button, not the chat, but the Q&A button as questions and comments arise as we go through Dave's um, uh, Dave's talk, so I will silence myself. And if uh, if we can launch uh, the video, thank you. As Nick said, I'm a trustee of the Patients Association whose purpose in life is to ensure that everyone receives the health and care services that they need to live well. And nowadays that means we have to ensure that services are designed in partnership with patients. I'm also on the Digital Health Council of the Royal Society of Medicine, and their objective is to help people understand how digital technology contributes to patient-centered healthcare. The views expressed in this presentation are my personal views and are not endorsed by either of these organizations. I will give examples from the UK, but the lessons are the same wherever we look. Healthcare is designed for patients, not by them. Throughout my career, I've been involved in digital transformation in, uh, across a range of different industries, and I've often jumped ahead of the adoption curve and been the person in an organisation pushing for adoption. I'm a passionate believer in the power of digital transformation. Uh, but management of IT development and pushing for change in organisations has presented many challenges. The issues that come up and obstacles to progress are strangely similar. So over time, my health has thrown me many challenges and I have a lot of experience as a patient, both good and bad, uh, both in the National Health Service and in the private sector. And these uh, chronic conditions continue to be a problem and <clears throat> nowadays we all at my age we're all uh, doing the care coordination for our uh, older relatives so i'm um, 
h- helping um, coordinate care for uh, my 92 year old aunt and my 98 year old father. I'm going to give you some examples from their experience. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about patient enabled health records. I'm going to give an examples of solutions uh, used by myself and by patients and professionals. And I'll highlight some of the uh, pet problems that I've encountered as a patient. I'll speak about patient enabled healthcare records and my experience in North West London. And I'm going to focus on the summary care record, which is a national project intended to share the most important information in a patient's health record. I then want to bring to your attention two technologies which show considerable potential to deliver change. I'm going to focus on England's National Health Service, but it may surprise attendees from other countries to learn that the issues that face us in digital transformation of health services are pretty much the same everywhere. The NHS in England is not a single entity. There are 227 NHS trusts that provide hospital, emergency, mental health and community care, and 7,000 GP practices who are responsible for primary care, and they also act as a gateway to the secondary care in trusts. And in addition, there are over 18,500 adult social care providers that sit totally outside of the NHS's accountability structure. Each of these uh, organisations operate paper-based or many separate digital systems and each is a separate legal entity which has profound implications for data sharing amongst them. What I want as a patient is a single complete healthcare record that I can see and it is shared by all the healthcare providers that may treat me. But as we see, patient records are fragmented Many organisations still use paper records or any number of separate digital systems. The NHS aspiration is to link these together regionally. There are already 14 such in, uh, information exchanges and the NHS long-term plan sets out that all regional exchanges should be in place by 2023, with some means of data exchange within and presumably also between them. The National Audit Office, whose remit is to examine public expenditure, recently reported on the NHS's state of readiness for digital transformation, and they found it lacking in several respects. In particular, this goal is more of an aspiration than a scoped and budgeted project, so in simple project management terms, it's not likely to happen. COVID has undoubtedly accelerated the use of digital healthcare systems of various kinds, but this type of project uh, linking linking systems together needs many organisations to coordinate with one another and clearly there hasn't been time for that. Furthermore, it needs patient involvement to ensure that the re resulting systems are both usable and used. It's telling that in the report, although there are 79 mentions of the word patient, nowhere does it speak about this necessity for patient involvement in, in service design. So what does one of these regional information exchanges look like? Here's the patient portal for the care information exchange developed by the Imperial College Healthcare Trust for patients across Northwest London. Uh, it's actually my patient record and we're viewing, um, or we would be viewing the results of a couple of x-rays. Data flows from hospital systems across the region into this patient portal. I can get my test results directly and in many instances, I could also use it to communicate with my care team. Not only that, but if GPs subscribe to the service, then the patient can also see their primary care health record. And the GP practice will be able to directly access hospital appointments and test results and see reports emanating from the hospital care teams. Patients can also enter information from their fitness or healthcare devices and share them with their care team. And as we know, this will become a growing source of healthcare information in the future. So what's the catch? Well, uptake by hospitals and other institutions has been slow. I'm not dismayed by this. And I think the current pandemic will substantially accelerate adoption now some of the other barriers have been removed. So here you can see the adoption over time of uh, the system. Um, the Northwest London population 
is about 2.4 million. And the, the exchange currently holds records for over 1.6 million patients. But today it's used by only 66,000 of them. As you can see, the system is not confined to patients in Northwest London. The map on the left shows that they come from all over the UK. So those are the, uh, that, that's where their primary care uh, GPs would be located. This system, as I said, was set up by the Imperial College uh, Healthcare Trust um, and itself responsible for several hospitals in the region. And they have over 1 million outpatient contacts per annum. But even here, the fragmentation of healthcare is evident. Within hospitals, individual care teams need to sign up their patients or patients need to sign up themselves. Many teams weren't aware of the system, but patients began to become aware of the system at the end of 2018, using the check-in kiosks in the outpatient departments. Only a fraction of the hospitals and teams within them are currently signed up though. In the second quarter of 2020, there was a big mail shot to patients to get them to a list. And right now, as I say, we have 66,000 patients on the system. My GP practice holds a lot of my key medical information and GPs have been reluctant to share their patient records with the system. Only 27 out of a total 400 GP practices have signed up, even though it's only a single click on their system console to enable it to push data to the exchange. Um, they, GPs seem to have an irrational concern that it will create work for them. My practice, for example, is completely oblivious to the fact that I get my hospital test results at the same time as they do. So I and most of the other patients on the system do not get access to our records held by primary care. And of course, when I'm treated at hospitals outside of the region, I wouldn't get sight of my records there either. As I said, I, I think this may begin to change now due to COVID. So Imperial College Healthcare Trust from last month required all of its staff to register on the system in order to receive their own COVID test results. And there's also a plan to provide testing to GP practices and other hospitals across the region, which would immediately make them aware of the service. So I think there's considerable hope. So let's look now at GP held records and how patients like me can access them. There are two major systems accounting for most of the GP practices in the UK, but whether to allow patient, the patient's access is up to each practice. When you ha have access, you can do all of these things online. Uh, view your medical record, manage appointments, re request repeat medication, message the healthcare service, and there's even an app for that. Uh, recently, many have added online consultations, either in real time or delayed through the use of forms. Now we can see that patients who can access the healthcare record are more active in their own care. And as we know from several studies using the patient activation measure, the activated patients have better outcomes for example, between 40 to 60% of patients log into the care information exchange every month. And over 30% of them respond weekly to a COVID survey that is currently running. Here's another shining example of activated patients as accessing their own healthcare information. The My Diabetes My Way project across N NHS Scotland has over 50,000 patients enrolled. 71% of them are active and 70% of those uh, who registered since 2010 when the service began remain as active users. Patients using the online platform have better outcomes on all measures and are more motivated to make better use of consultations than other patients. Now I want to talk about the one part of the patient's healthcare record that is supposedly shared across the entire NHS in England. I single this out for mention here because it contains the most important information and is intended to be shared across all institutions and especially for emergency care when it might not be feasible to get information directly from the patient. 
The summary care record contains demographic information, information on allergies and adverse reactions to specific drugs. It also has a list of the patient's current and recent medication and their significant medical history, observations, treatment and investigation results. It records any special communication or support needs the patient has, for example, contacts such as the next of kin and a patient's personal preferences intended, for example, for end of life care. And recently, COVID status has been added to that list. For some reason that still eludes me, you cannot access your summary care record online. And if you want to see or change it, you must speak to your GP. Uh, now, despite all this, the summary care record is underutilized. And in, in several instances, this can adversely affect patient care. I want to give you some examples from a patient's perspective of this underutilization of the summary care record. I have power of attorney for my 92 year old aunt and I'm registered with her GP as next of kin. I know this because I went there too in person to register. Last year she had several falls. The ambulance crew phoned my 98 year old father who is disabled and has his own care problems in the middle of the night. He tried to answer their questions, including giving them incorrect information in an attempt to be helpful. My aunt was admitted to hospital for a UTI where confusion is a symptom. When I visited her, I discovered that my deceased mother was recorded as her next of kin with my father's phone number. This had come from A&E who'd admitted her. I changed the next of kin contact in the ward and asked them to update the hospital record. This happened not once, but several times. I hadn't followed the NHS advice to speak to the GP if I wanted the summary care record updated, if that is indeed where the misinformation was coming from. Many patients complain about being asked the same questions over and over by different doctors. What the patient tells them is not necessarily reliable, as the next two examples will show. A caller to the Patients Association helpline gave us an example of where the summary care record was definitely correct, but wasn't consulted. He was the carer for his wife, who has Alzheimer's, when she needed to be admitted to hospital. Staff asked his wife out of his earshot if she had any allergies. She said no. The summary care record listed an antibiotic allergy, but this wasn't checked. She was about to be given the antibiotic, but thankfully the husband intervened. He, like many others, called the helpline to ask what he could do to ensure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. Well, in 2019, my, my 98-year-old father was referred by his GP to the hospital's vascular clinic who diagnosed very poor circulation in his legs. My father thought he was on long-term treatment with PPI for esophageal reflux, although it had been stopped over a year previously. I imagine that is why the vascular clinic thought it was safe to start him on blood thinners. Simply by consulting his summary care record, they would have known the true situation. Six weeks later, he had symptoms of gastrointestinal bleeding. The GP directed him to A&E and he was seen in the gastro clinic who diagnosed esophageal ulceration. The blood thinners had caused his ulcers to bleed. They stopped his blood thinners, restarted his PPI and wrote in a paper discharge note that the GP should inform the vascular team. That would have given them the opportunity to consider some alternative treatment. I don't think this communication happened, but in any case, the GP updated his medication record and the summary care record would have then shown that the blood thinner had been stopped. Uh, he was not referred back to the vascular clinic though. And several months later, <clears throat> he began complaining of pains in his legs and feet that actually kept him awake most nights. The GP made a new referral to the vascular team, but this wasn't treated as urgent and he was told he would have a long wait. Meanwhile, the pains in his leg got worse and eventually he was seen by the frailty nurse after he suffered a fall. 
She called the vascular team, who advised her that there was no urgency. This is inexplicable, except that their clinic record probably showed he was still on blood thinners, so they didn't suspect a blood clot. One week later, we managed to get him an emergency appointment with the vascular clinic, but it was too late. They found that the circulation in one leg was totally blocked by a blood clot, and two days later, his leg was amputated. I'm not implying that the amputation could have necessarily been avoided, but the straightforward and direct sharing of information via the summary care record would have ensured that the teams involved would have had the correct information in front of them at the time that they were taking decisions. So it appears the summary care record is not being consulted. I had a look at the NHS dashboard and took a typical week in 2019. There were 2 million outpatient appointments, 325,000 hospital admissions and 475,000 A&E attendances in that week alone, but only 163,000 summary care record lookups. That's less than 6% of the occasions when it could have been viewed. I asked around and I discovered that, yes, there's a lack of awareness, but it looks like if someone already has a hospital record, that will be consulted first and it doesn't automatically pull in any data from the summary care record. So the reason people are, are already logged into their hospital system and information governance adversely affects the usability of the summary care record. Healthcare practitioners need to insert their smart card and separately from their hospital system, log into the summary care record, select their role, answer a challenge question, search for the patient, and then log that they've requested the patient's permission before they can view the record. It's just several steps too many for information that just ought to be there. I mentioned earlier that GPs have control over allowing patients to access their record online. Well, GPs also have control over whether the summary care record contains just the bare bones information of allergies and current medications, or whether in fact the additional information, for example, on conditions and treatments is included. However, on March the 20th, the Department of Health took extra powers to compel all of this information to be shared. On April the 23rd, NHS Digital simply switched on full summary care record sharing, effectively overriding individual GP surgeries settings. They also made it possible for any primary care clinic or indeed for the 111 service to view any patient's GP record using an NHS Digital service called GP Connect. This has made it possible for GP practices to flexibly collaborate during the pandemic and to provide extended hours services. NHS Digital made it clear, however, that these powers will only be used for the pandemic and have to be reviewed, renewed rather, on the 30th of September. Well, I for one sincerely hope that this override will outlive the pandemic and that the awareness and habitual use of the summary care record will grow as a result. So what do patients think about healthcare record sharing? Well, most patients expect that healthcare workers treating them would have access to their record and they are shocked when they discover that they don't. Most would happily share their data for research purposes provided they're properly informed and consented. In fact, the more specific a researcher can be about the intended use, the more willing patients are to share. And most would also be happy to share data from their wearables or smartphone. And here's another use case where patients expect their data to be shared, but for information governance reasons, it is not. It's usually not possible for ambulance crews to discover the fate of the patients they hand over to hospital care, where clearly it would be in everyone's best interest if they could discover whether their diagnosis and immediate treatment was correct. And in fact, how the patient whose life they may have just saved went on to recover. I'm grateful to Matthew Snowshill of St Bart's for bringing his project named Fem Feedback to my attention. They've shown how beneficial this information sharing can be. The Patients Association recently carried out a survey of the patient experience asking what is it like to be a patient. When they asked what single thing would have made your experience better, the responses highlight 
the importance of a single shared comprehensive healthcare record under the patient's control. So that's what patients want, but the reality is quite different. The patient is not in control and often has to repeat important information over and over. Data is not necessarily correct or up to date or simply not available when needed or visible to patients. And research opportunities are wasted because there are no easy ways of locating patients or advising them of the opportunities. It's also difficult for SMEs to develop clinical applications that can read or write to electronic healthcare records. So how will we bring about true digital transformation? Future healthcare systems will run on data, but this data will be even more prolific and its collection could become even more fragmented than today. So let's imagine a world that eliminates silos of information controlled by multiple intermediaries, where for each of us there was an up-to-date, verifiable, real-time record of every encounter we have ever had with a healthcare professional, where we could incorporate personal and lifestyle data, where the patient was ultimately in control of sharing this comprehensive record or aspects of it with researchers, where nevertheless clinical governance principles were followed where SMEs could easily read or write to a patient's record with straightforward authorization, and where in the future artificial agents could browse the data and make inferences that would assist in clinical decision making or to help us to take proactive measures to maintain good health. All of this while maintaining our ultimate right to privacy. Imagine that an entire ecosystem of software apps can be developed, tested on real data and commercialized in a lightweight regulatory regime. Patients would remain in control of who gets to use their data, but they or the National Health Service would be rewarded through a micropayment system when their data leads to successful commercial exploitation. Is this a pipe dream? Well, let me change gears and tell you about a technology that could help to bring this about. Distributed ledger technology, more familiarly known as blockchain, is the technology behind Bitcoin. This is a form of collective bookkeeping via the internet that enables multiple parties who do not necessarily trust one another to reach a single record of truth. Instead of an information exchange, illustrated here on the left as a central hub that needs to access multiple systems, the multiple systems together in a network maintain a single record of truth using irreversible cryptographic hashes. A complete patient record, such as the one I described earlier, is extremely suited to this kind of treatment. It is a series of sequential events which over time involve multiple organizations. Later events often depend on earlier ones. Each transaction would describe the addition of a resource to the official patient record by an authorized person, with the resource itself, i.e. the substance of the health record, stored externally. I won't elaborate any further here, but I refer you to the literature for more information. For example, if you look up the all-party parliamentary group on blockchain, you'll find several useful references. One of the other benefits of this technology is that it helps with establishing data provenance. Machine-generated data will be stored with information about the type of equipment used, its calibration status, and a precise timestamp. Patients' own devices would record information into the transaction log and would be clearly identifiable as such. Algorithms used to process the data would also leave their imprint in the record. As these algorithms become more critical to the implementation of medicine, with black box machine learning increasingly a feature of prediction and care, the ability to review and manage the supply chain of care data for a whole population becomes important. Otherwise, if an error is found in an algorithm used to make a diagnosis, how would you backtrack in order to identify everyone affected? Ahead of the availability of a vaccine against COVID, several countries, including those in the UK, are considering immunity or antibody certificates. These electronic or paper documents would certify your antibody status i.e. that you've been tested and found to have antibodies. And the Centre for Data Ethics recently published a briefing note which drew a lot of attention. 
Both the Open University and the Alan Turing Institute have initiatives to develop these certificates in a privacy preserving way. And there are several other initiatives around the world. The Alan Turing Institute solution can be app or paper based, whereas the Open Universities is purely online. It uses blockchain for privacy and Tim Berners-Lee's uh, decentralized personal data platform. This is now being pursued by BT with the Real Royal Pharmaceutical Society and two technology companies. But on a note of caution, I also recommend that you take a look at these articles from Harvard Medical School and the Harvard Berkman Institute for Internet and Society. The authors maintain that restricting movement on the basis of biology threatens freedom, fairness and public health. And the other technology I wanted to draw your attention to was augmented reality. The patient experience survey that the Patients Association undertook also told us unsurprisingly that being a patient is scary and frustrating. And for COVID patients, the experience of being cared for by a team of healthcare workers in full or partial PPE is especially frightening. So here is a technology to help with that. The Imperial College uh, Healthcare Trust used the Microsoft HoloLens, which is a computer worn on your head, which projects an image in front of you. Um, and this has led to a fall in the amount of time staff need to spend in high risk areas of up to 83% and also just puts one professional in PPE in front of the patient. And the rest can be in the, in the safety of an office environment uh, uh, but can still take part in the consultation. It, it's significantly reducing the amount of PPE being used as only the doctor wearing the headset has to dress up. Uh, early estimates show that it's saving uh, the Imperial College Trust 700 items of PPE per ward per week. So that completes the substance of my presentation. I've talked about the fragmentation of healthcare services with communication gaps between service providers that are all too apparent to patients, but perhaps not so clear to service providers. Many different teams are often involved in a single care pathway and patients often experience several different care pathways in parallel. Somehow these disparate organizations need to maintain a single record of truth. I've talked about patients' expect expectations of data sharing and how the reality falls very far short of this. In the future, data will become even more prolific, especially with the increasing availability of wearable and consumer devices and with genomics and metabonomics. And rather than stifling its use by information governance, we need to find ways to make it more accessible to data-driven algorithms, but in a privacy-preserving way. And I've discussed briefly how distributed ledger technology may come to be used in the data supply chain. So perhaps it's time to think not just about the technology, but also to examine the social contract regarding the sharing and use of personal data. I've talked about the power and underutilization of patient portals and the importance of the activated patient. And I talked about how the pandemic has increased the uptake of some of these digital first technologies, but that this has happened at the single organization or care team level and not at the systems level needed for true digital transformation. And my final and perhaps most important point is that systems need to be designed with patients and healthcare professionals, not for them. This is something that everyone talks about, but very few accomplish. Well, the patient experience report I mentioned earlier is about to be published by the Patients Association. 
And they've also undertaken a survey of patients' experience of services under lockdown. And you, you should be able to find those on the website. If anyone is interested in following up this work, please get in touch. And especially if you wish to explore how to involve patients in your own research, you can email me at this address. Excellent. Uh, so Dave, thank you uh, once again um, uh, for this talk. I mean, we give to an audience of uh, implementation scientists um, in this sort of post-COVID crisis phase. Um, so I would encourage you to use the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so do raise questions and comments there. We already have one um, by Greg Ahrens. Uh, Greg, do you want to unmute your mic and, uh, and ask the question directly so Dave can should be allowed to talk. Greg, you're muted. Uh, okay. Yeah, there you're good. Go. Okay. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. This is so uh, informative and learned many things that I really took for granted. Um, I'm wondering with the, um, you know, technology that you were describing, Dave, um, what are the risks in the systems? For example, how impervious or vulnerable are these systems to hacking or cyber intrusions? Well, actually, <laughs> that will take a long time to answer that question. It's a, it's a, a very astute question. Um, I think one of the things, though, uh, that I, I'll just say, I mean, I, I can um, possibly provide you some references if you want to, to, to research it further, but um, one of the interesting things about blockchain is that it is resilient to attack. Uh, one of the things that happened, um, you know, when the NHS was a attacked um, um, two years ago was uh, with the, wanna the WannaCry uh, virus, um, was that a lot of systems had to be taken off the air, had to be taken off the internet for fear of um, infection. And some of the systems that were infected became unavailable. Um, so one of the benefits of blockchain is that the information is distributed across the system. And so it's a single point of it. There isn't a single point of failure, um, but there's a lot more to the, there's a lot more to be said about the security of these systems than, than just that. Okay. Thank you. Dave, thank you. Questions are coming in, so I, I will chair this. Uh, John, do you want to unmute your mic and ask uh, your very important question about um, excluding um, patient uh -huh. service users um, who may not have knowledge or access? John? Yes, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, thank you, Dave. Super. Uh, two questions, digital divide. Here in, in Sweden, um, uh, we have uh, an open portal and I can see all my written medical records, lab tests, uh, prescriptions and everything from my primary care GP. And only recently that's then been connected with the acute care hospital. So it takes time and there's an exchange thing. However, it's taken me a long time to learn how to do this and I have to do go through various steps and things. And for people who uh, maybe who, who do not know the language or are technologically challenged, I don't necessarily mean older people. Uh, I also mean, well, a whole variety of different people. And also people who simply do not have the money for tech uh, um, and to be able to do this. And that relates to a second thing about getting test results back to people quickly because if you do a PCA test um, and the length of time is sorry a PCR test and length of time is say longer than two or three days to get back to the per person it begins to defeat the uh, defeat the objectives of it also uh, for PCR testing going back to residents of care homes uh, in our situation um, the general practitioner has to be informed of the result and then relay it to the care home 
uh, to, to the actual resident individually. Uh, so the whole set of interactions here between privacy, um, uh, professional <laughs> privilege, yeah. uh, protectionism and so on. So there are a number of issues. I don't know if you want to react or uh, respond to any of those from the uh, English perspective. Well, they're the same issues uh, universally, and, and you're right to point them out. And of course, the digital divide is a bit of a problem. Uh, and it, as, as you say, it doesn't break down in terms of uh, older people not necessarily incapable of using the technology. My 98-year-old father uses an iPad and um, you know, does his supermarket order quite happily. Um, <laughs> Yes. I, I, think, um, I think basically my point is that um, we need to do positive efforts to enable those who find difficulty or are challenged by this to so that they don't and often they need this these systems more, especially in the COVID tide demonstrates that. And now, I know in five yeah. years time it's going to be a lot easier and less clunky, but should we just wait until they get their act together? It, uh, no, <laughs> we shouldn't. And, and, and I, I didn't put any slides in on this, but my other big beef is usability. Um, the, a lot of these systems are just not designed to be usable and uh, you, can, you can design in uh, you, you know, you can use user-centered design principles to ensure that the systems are usable. So at the Patients Association, we get lots of phone calls from people who, who have been completely flawed, um, not because they're incapable of using digital technology, but because the GP system was too complex for them to use and the way it had been set up uh, ha wasn't um, immediately obvious. So there are some facilities that appear to be available, but actually when you try to use them, you find they've been switched off by the GP. So, I mean, the uh, user interfaces can be simplified tremendously. That, that goes some way to uh, overcome the, uh, the digital divide, but um, every system needs to be designed with the users in mind. That means that it has to be designed with patients for patients. So thank you. I'm sure we could uh, spend the rest of the time talking about digital device. A really good question, John. Uh, thank you. But let me go through. There's a few others that are coming through um, at the moment. So Katie, you're talking about patient feedback. Would you like to uh, put your comment to Dave? Hi. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, thank you. Um, great. Thanks, Dave. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering if I could pick up on the, the kind of um, patient feedback aspect of the care information exchange platform in particular. So you mentioned as well that um, patients have the option to kind of add their thoughts to their health journal and maybe input their fitness information. Um, I wondered whether there's been much work done on this and how this, in, this um, aspect specifically uh, affects the kind of activated patient benefits that, that people were seeing. Um, and whether this has any impact on the kind of efficiency of appointments and what clinicians think of that um, and just kind of your personal views on that aspect of it. Yeah, um, well, we actually have a webinar on the power of patient generated data. It's a webinar series that's been running at the Royal Society of Medicine and <clears throat> next Wednesdays is a panel um, from Imperial College Healthcare Trust that will be talking about the care information exchange and how they've actually extended that into the community so that uh, when patients are discharged from hospital or if they need a condition to be monitored in the community, uh, they, the hospital provides a wearable that puts information into the care, uh, into the patient portal and provides that back to the specialist. So uh, it, it's early days yet, but but there's going to be considerable amount of work in that in that area now. I mean, I'm an, I'm an optimist, and you see, there's only sixty six thousand patients using the system. There could could be there's one point six million re patient records in the system, so there's a lot of potential for uh, for in, you know for increasing use of the system. So it's still early days. So, Katie, thank you. A related question by, by Proker. Proker, would you like to uh, make your comments about behaviour change, uh, particularly from um, um, the clinician side of things? You might be muted. I think, I think he might have dropped out. I think his internet might be. Okay, I, I so, 
Well, I can convey the question because I think it's important. So Proctor has picked up on some of your data, uh, Dave, that where 60% of the patients uh, were happy to share their data, only 30% of the um, clinicians were, and I think you're referring to GPs. And his question is, how do we change the mindsets um, of clinicians? And he's a surgeon himself. Oh, it was much less than that, actually. It was, t okay. I mean, it was 27 GP practices out of a potential 400 that Indeed. had okay, provided, so that had, had, yeah, that had given their patients access to the system. Um, I think by by demonstrating the usefulness of the system, I mean, those GP practices that are using it uh, find that they can get access immediately to hospital records that they otherwise have to access through several steps. Um, and then also, um, I'm quite hopeful that as uh, GPs begin to use the, the system as patients themselves, they'll see the benefits. But um, okay, so use, usage will increase. Will show you demonstrate the benefits of, of um, implementing those um, as, as yeah. strategy. Um, uh, I will we'll take another two minutes, and then we need to break. So we have two more questions. Uh, one by Ramesh. Ramesh. Hello. Um, yeah, yep. really interesting um, on on um, patient records. I was wondering if you could also give some thoughts on patient perspectives making the implementation of digital mental health interventions. So things like um, guided computer programs or virtual reality, given you mentioned augmented reality. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about patient involvement in that to make sure it meets patient needs. Yeah, I mean, uh, um these services need to be designed with patients um, and you know it all begins with research I mean I, I was involved in a research project with the University of Warwick where they were uh, teaching social skills to uh, teenagers who are showing signs of schizophrenia and we use virtual reality for that uh, and uh, the whole environment all, all aspects of it were designed with the with the uh, intended patients um, and went through several iterations uh, with them. So I think that's the, um, somebody actually asked what, what experience do patients need to be able to get involved yes. in co-design? Do, do they need direct experience of a service? Absolutely. That's the one qualification. The, the one um, party that sees all aspects of a care pathway is the patient and quite often they're being served by, um, you know, there are different, there are several different uh, points of contact with different services and gaps between them. The patient is the person that sees all of those gaps. Get, the patient, one... get patients involved in everything. Sorry, the very last words and last question here to Zani. Zani, do you want to ask your question? You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I was just interested to know if you'd been involved in the development of any implementation strategies, so to promote the use of patient portals, and um, and if so, what have you found to be the most successful strategies? Well, I haven't been directly involved, but I'm aware of a patient, a patient participation group um, attached to a, a, a CCG, so, so there were a number of um, GP practices. Um, they implemented a, a patient portal into the primary care system and patients were, were, uh, were just left, actually this is most GP practices, switch this on and leave, uh, leave the patients to figure it out themselves. The companies that provide the patient portals uh, are often not asked to pro provide end user support. Uh, and, and refer patients back to the GP practice, who, who in the GP practice uh, is employed to help patients use these systems. The patient participation group took over um, that role and they personally walked patients through the system. You know, they phoned people up and talked them through the system. So they provided one-to-one -one training that wasn't provided by the GP practice, that was provided by a voluntary patient participation group. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, David. Another great example of how, um, what strategy we can put in place to, to um, uh, facilitate um, to facilitate access. Really nice uh, case study. So, um, well, thank you so much for taking, working with us and, and um, doing a fantastic 
uh, plenary to get us all thinking about specifically about implementing um, uh, IT driven interventions specifically so patient care records. Uh, I think, as you said, the issues that you've raised touch upon different systems, healthcare systems, IT systems, and indeed countries. Uh, so thank you very much for making the time um, and thank you all for attending and